Good evening and welcome everybody here to this public lecture as part of the National Security College's Securing Our Future in Cyberspace Conference. Firstly, I'd like to uh, welcome, uh, we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. I welcome you all to the National Security College, which is a joint initiative of the Commonwealth and the Australian National University. It is a centre of excellence in teaching, learning and thinking on issues of national security policy. Today we have with us for the public lecture, Professor Fred Kate, whose bio you will have seen on our, on our web page. He is the Vice President of Research at Indiana University, a distinguished professor and C. Ben Dutton Professor of Law at the Indiana University Mora School of Law and also an adjunct professor in the School of Informatics and Computing. His work focuses on information privacy, security law and policy issues. He served for over 10 years as, a, as the director of the University Centre for Applied Cybersecurity Research and has many other appointments to his name. He's been a member of various institutes and also has been uh, has written extensively on legal and security issues associated with cyberspace has appeared before congressional committees and is also an advocate on issues related to privacy and security and legal issues associated with cyberspace. He's very inter interestingly written about moving the onus of privacy away from the individual back to companies and others in the context of consent. And today uh, he will be addressing us for a period of about 40 minutes after which we'll have time for question and answer on answers and also there will be refreshments afterwards for people who want to stay behind and continue the discussion. So without further ado, I'll invite Professor Kate to join us. Thank you very much, uh, thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Thank you uh, for coming. Um, I hope there's seats for everyone. I've never spoken to a room in which there was difficulty finding a seat. So if you think somebody else is coming after me and that's what you're waiting for, I'm Terribly sorry, this is as good as it gets. Um, so I would like to talk about um, the challenge of cybersecurity as a legal issue. And I'm gonna use the term law here in its broadest definition. So not just law as informal statutory law or decisional case law, but really thinking of law as governance, law as uh, uh, in, in parallel with policy as a way in which a society or an institution governs itself. And I'm going to start with a few points which I think are going to be absolutely taken as given and I'm going to go through them very quickly. But I want to at least make sure we're on the same page so you'll know where I'm coming from. And if they're not given, you'll have an ample opportunity uh, to disagree with me. And let me also say what a real pleasure it is to be here. Now, in fairness, it's always a pleasure to be in Australia, but to be in Australia uh, when the temperature I left at home is um, considerably lower than the temperature that I found here. And to be here in the presence of so many colleagues doing interesting work, I, I could not be more grateful. And I particularly want to thank Roger uh, Bradbury for, for hosting this and for organizing it. So um, again, I hope I'm on safe ground here. But our economy, our society, our daily lives all depend on data. And we generate data in almost everything we do. Uh, the mere fact you're sitting here with your cell phone on is broadcasting your location. It's constantly generating data. Um, you could be using the recording device on your cell phone to be taking a video and an auditory uh, recording. There's sensors in the roof. There's a camera here. There are data that are collected in thousands of ways every single, part, every single day in our lives. And as somebody who just got off an airplane this morning, I'm reminded again of this constantly being observed as you move around uh, your daily life. Increasingly, we see data being created or inferred about us. So I'm going to predict something about you based on your past data, and then I'm going to use it to, to, to rate you, to evaluate you. Uh, your, what you will pay for a mortgage or, a, or a, a loan for a car or a home will depend upon my prediction based on your past behavior as to what I think your future behavior will be. All a data-driven industry. But it's not just data in the sense of like information about me. It's not data like we might think about data protection. It's also data that we increasingly rely on as part of this incredibly complex and spreading cyber infrastructure 
that increasingly runs our lives. Uh, payment systems. You know, I was thinking about it today, I got off an airplane having absolutely no local currency. And you couldn't have done that, you know, 20 years ago. Today, I know one of the pieces of plastic in my wallet will turn itself into currency because the control system, the, the, the command and control system actually works. It's interconnected and suddenly my bank account can be linked with an Australian bank 9,000 miles away. Our transportation infrastructure, we increasingly control using database systems. I flew here on a lovely double-decker A380, a plane which has not one physical control surface in the plane. There is nothing that connects the pilot to the controls other than data, other than zeros and ones being sent uh, either wirelessly over a, or over a fixed grid. Um, we see this in utilities, our just-in-time supply and manufacturing chain. Um, every single time, uh, just in time, I go to um, get my car serviced, I'm always told, you know, the part will be there tomorrow, I can come back. It's not really just in time, but the point is, we order things based on how we use them. And it is that supply system that controls costs that makes it possible to extend service farther. And of course, command and control systems in military and civilian operations, which I suspect we're all familiar with. Now, these two worlds, the world of vast amounts of data that, that might be what we would think of as data or information, and these data-controlled systems are rapidly merging, and they're coming together in a way that is, um, we are at the, just the cusp of what is truly going to be an information uh, revolution. Right? A, a revolution that's going to be marked by ubiquitous sensors, sensors in everything, sensors in our devices at home, sensors in our clothing, sensors in our, uh, um, our cars, which are already, uh, the average car sold in the United States today has 34 separate computing devices in it. Right? You no longer drive a car in and try to like make the noise for the mechanic that it made when you were driving. Instead, your mechanic waves a magic wand over the car, collects the data from it wirelessly, and tells you what's wrong with your car. Right? But this world, we are just at the edge of this extraordinary change. And we talk about this sometimes as the Internet of Things, but I, I don't want to focus on a particular ism to describe this. I, I want to just paint a picture, whether it's terrifying or brilliant, you can have it any way you want it, in which we see that these systems, this interaction of, of data and, and, and systems, are going to completely alter the way we live. Another example of this is machine learning, where we don't tell the computer what to do, the computer figures out what to do. Right? And there are all sorts of examples of this. Some of them right now that we deal with are incredibly trivial. I now find when I get in my car to drive home, my phone, which is someplace, pops up a little message that says seven and a half minutes to your home in current traffic. Well, how does it know I'm going home? Right? It's like another wife. It's unbelievable. And how does it know what the traffic is? I live in a little tiny town. We don't even have traffic. But it knows because yesterday at the same time I went home and because it watched those patterns and because, of course, it's collecting data from other people's phones to know how fast they're moving on the same route. And it's making an educated guess, which turns out unfortunately, to be accurate. Okay. This is, of course, the foundation of now healthcare, personalized medicine, this idea of incredibly targeted treatments. This is going to be the way in which we increasingly mark our lives are going to be these granular data systems. But the challenge is that they're not secure. None of them are. They just aren't. And we just have to take that as given. And if this is something we need to stop and debate, I'm happy to do it. Right? Think about, really, just imagine, what do you think is the most secure system? The one place we'd say, that will be secure. Well, in the United States, we probably would have said the National Security Agency, which, of course, Edward Snowden walked out of with a collection of documents showing it was completely insecure. In fact, you didn't even have to be that bright to walk out with its greatest secrets. Or think about the Office of Personnel Management in the White House, which is what processes security clearances for personnel who work for the government. This would be secure until, of course, it lost all of its records when its computer system was infiltrated. Right? 
So name a system that is in fact secure, that you're confident is secure. There's not one. So we are building our lives on these tools that are not trustworthy. And we've known this from the beginning. None of this is new. This is not some revelation. I always use this quote from the Washington Post. It's from an op-ed that the former NSA director, Mike McConnell, wrote in 2010. The United States is fighting a cyber war today, and we are losing. It's that simple. Well, that's comforting. Uh, when President Obama came into office, one of the first things he did, much to his credit, was launch this cybersecurity initiative to assess the state of cybersecurity. And that report, even after being edited for security reasons, read, the architecture of the nation's digital infrastructure based largely upon the internet is neither secure nor resilient. Okay. So this is what we're building our future on, is this um, resource that is neither secure nor resilient. So what I want to focus on today is while we think about cybersecurity primarily or often as a technical issue, we describe it in terms of computers and computer vulnerabilities. We often place it in computer science programs. And for example, when the president announced, as President Obama did uh, just last week, that he's going to create a new security officer for the federal government, it's based in the CIO's office. It's thought of as a data issue. But I would argue it's not, and that this is frankly why we're in the mess we're in, because we keep thinking of it that way. That if you in fact look at the real vulnerabilities we face, they are almost all involving individual or organizational behavior, and legal and economic incentives, and frameworks created by law and policy. Now, I could give you lots of examples uh, of this, and um, it would just be tedious. But let me say that if you look at all of the major published attacks, the ones we know about in recent years, Chase, Sony, Anthem, Apple, State Department, IRS, OPM, you name it, every single one involved either a phishing message, which persuaded someone to hand over their login credentials, or by guessing user passwords, because they were such poorly selected passwords. Think about that. Every single one had at its heart a fundamental user error. In fact, around the world, depending upon the study you look at, between 85 and 90% of all successful cyber attacks have exploited a human vulnerability. So no amount of technical cybersecurity is going to protect us against an employee who gives away his or her access credentials, whether knowingly or unknowingly, or who chooses a password that can be guessed so easily. Moreover, I'm not just going to dump on individuals today, although I have plenty to say about individuals. Institutions face very few serious legal or business incentives to engage in effective cybersecurity. Really think about it. Now, I don't know a great deal about the Australian legal system. I know a fair amount about the US. Outside of a few regulated industries, such as healthcare and banking, and even there, I would be happy to come back and suggest the laws are not very strong, there is no legal obligation to provide cybersecurity. N none whatsoever. We, we just assume people are going to do it, because that's how our economy works. It's based on altruism that people are going to spend money to secure something for somebody else to use out of the kindness of their hearts. Look at the way we have treated cybersecurity as a practical matter. When we look at cyber attacks that exploit uh, vulnerabilities in software, in almost every case, we have known about the vulnerability for years, in some cases for decades, we just haven't patched it. You know, Microsoft released the patch, it's just you, large institutional players in particular haven't deployed the patch. We still have 11% of the population that's using, um, I, I usually have to sit down when I say this, Windows XP, even though it's not had a security patch 
in months now because Microsoft's abandoned it. That includes, by the way, hospitals. My mother had open heart surgery in the fall. When we went into the recovery room, there was this bank of monitors, one of which was giving the XP error message because it wasn't working. And I thought, that's terrific. You are, you are connecting the systems keeping my mother alive to a software system that's not even being patched any longer. This suggests what is very much the point I want to leave you with today, which is I don't think we're taking cybersecurity very seriously. I mean, we talk about it a lot. We have meetings and conferences in lovely places. Um, we have task force and committees and commissions. But we're not treating it as the critical issue it is today. We're not treating it as the foundation upon which we are building increasingly our entire society, our national defense, our economic wherewithal, our research ability, our healthcare system, our transportation infrastructure, and yet it is not secure. And if you think about other areas in which we identify challenges, look at how we approach those. So when you think about things like transportation safety, auto safety, toxic pollution. We deal with those very differently. We treat those in a way that suggests their importance to our lives. If you look at the hallmarks of that and look at what we've done with cybersecurity, they don't match. So again, let me focus, if I may, on the US, although in this case I feel like I'm on very safe ground. The president last year, the budget we are currently living under um, it had in the budget uh, $14 billion for cybersecurity. It's a big number. Okay. It's just a tiny bit more than what we're spending on the joint strike fighter in the same year. Right? We can develop a fighter, we can secure our entire infrastructure, let's give it a similar investment. In fact, if you compare it with the type of money we spend on things where we have really invested our national interest, um, take, for example, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, which have cost, in direct cost, about $2 trillion each, or on an annual basis for their duration, about 20 times more than even the new request the president has made in his next budget of um, $19 billion for cybersecurity. In the United States, cybersecurity in the federal government is the responsibility of the, I swear to you, I'm not making this up, cybersecurity coordinator. Can you imagine addressing any issue you care about with a coordinator? Have we ever sent troops into the field under the command of a coordinator? Right? It's hard to imagine a surgery where you have a dozen surgeons gathered around and a coordinator to help them. Right? Things we take seriously, we put somebody in charge. We have a cabinet secretary. We have a commanding general. We have a prime minister. We have somebody in charge. Instead, our primary contribution to the law of cybersecurity in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the UK, EU, and 47 US states is breach notification laws. Your data is stolen, and so what do we do when we swing into action? We send you a letter telling you your data has been stolen. Imagine that in like public health. You know, it's hard to believe we would do with an outbreak of a virus by saying, let's send you a letter saying that we found you are, you've had this virus. In fact, in Washington today, the big cybersecurity debate is over information sharing. Right? To what extent can the private sector share information with the government? To what extent can state government share information with the federal government? and vice versa. But again, it's astonishing to think that we're still having that debate. Right? Can we talk to each other about this problem when we know that the people who are causing the problem are talking to each other all the time? Economists Bruce Berkowitz and Robert Hahn have observed that the government has largely rejected, and I quote, regulation, government standards, and the use of liability laws to, approve cyber, to improve cybersecurity. These are the basic building blocks of most public policies designed to shape public behavior. So one must wonder why they are being avoided like a deadly virus, so to speak. That's economist humor. They wrote that in 2003. 
And it's still true today. So what do we normally do when we face a serious challenge, when we face a, uh, something that could threaten our society? We usually look to markets and to law. If markets work, we use markets, and if they don't work, we use law, and sometimes we leap to law even when markets do work. Here there is lots of evidence that markets are simply not working well. Consumers don't make intelligent choices based on security. Security is almost always in tension with convenience. So the thing that is right is rarely the thing that consumers want. In fact, one of the most common things I hear from people in industry is we would love to use multi-factor authentication for online transactions, but we're not going to use it until our competitors use it, because if we tell our customers you can't log in without going and doing something, they're going to go be somebody else's customers. The reason we have seen such an extraordinary move to online systems has been in large part because they are cheaper. They are more convenient. It's not because they're more secure. And so if we think the market that got us in this situation is going to by itself get us out, I think we are sadly mistaken. Moreover, we deal with a problem in cybersecurity which is not at all unusual, but is nevertheless quite serious, which is extraordinarily inconsistent behavior. So, for example, we tell people never click on a link in an email, that's a tremendous security vulnerability, and then institutionally we send out emails with links in them. Right? I received a request for additional information from the Internal Revenue Service, it's the beginning of an audit. And it came with a message from the IRS that said, please click here to submit your data. I thought for sure this was a phishing message. It looked like a phishing message. It felt like a phishing message. And since I don't want to be audited, I hoped it was a phishing message. <laughs> but it was not. It is the way the IRS communicates with the public in violation of everything we've taught the public about what they should expect. So let me just quickly touch on five things that I think law in the sense of governance could do for us. One is it could just provide incentives for better behavior. Better behavior by individuals, better behavior by companies. Right? This is, of course, the way in which we deal with other problems like this. Uh, auto safety, food safety, pollution control, toxic waste. In every single case, we enacted a law that set standards and get create, created penalties for people who didn't meet those. Uh, Bruce Schneier, who is a well-known and, and highly regarded uh, cybersecurity, um, uh, uh, I was going to say observer, but let me say um, at times curmudgeon, said um, when looking at, for example, the recent announcements from the Obama administration proposing again more of the same of what we've been doing badly for the past decade, he said if you uh, want robust security, and I'm quoting, you're going to need a lot of borders and incentives to push people down the right path. And borders and incentives are what law is really good at doing. Okay. So lots of things. You could set standards. You could create liability for la absence of, uh, of, uh, of good cybersecurity behavior. We could have statutory damages. We could just say every time you breach someone's data, you owe them a check for a certain amount of money. It would add an absolute finite cost. You, a board of directors could look at that and could say, we're going to spend X number of million dollars to secure our infrastructure because we know if we fail to, it's going to cost us Y million dollars. We could have laws requiring multi-factor authentication. We could, for example, require chip and pin credit cards. You know, in the United States, it took us about a decade to catch on to using chip. We now, we're very proud, we're there. We've retooled our entire infrastructure to deal with it. We forgot the pin part. So we now have chip and, oh right, we didn't get that other authentication piece there. A law could have dealt with that in a second. Well, mandatory patch deployment. If we have trouble with large institutional users of computers not installing security patches, we could require them to do it. There are laws for things like that. We could have mandatory information sharing. Think about it, of all of these laws we have seen in the US and elsewhere, but particularly looking at the uh, law passed as part of the continuing budget resolution in December of 2015, these all are designed to facilitate information sharing. But who really wants to share information about their own vulnerabilities? You know, if you're a bank, would you run to the federal government and tell them, oh, by the way, we have these vulnerabilities, wanted to let you know may not be secure. We know you audited us, but we just thought we'd tell you. Right? 
How about mandatory information sharing? How about saying, if you have a security vulnerability, you must disclose it? We do it in lots of other areas. We have mandatory disclosures if there's a known defect in a house. We have mandatory disclosures around pharmaceutical products. We have mandatory disclosures throughout our lives, but not for security. So you can hold yourself out as a secure institution knowing it is a false claim and you do not violate a law. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not a nutcase here about regulation. I've spent most of my life opposing regulation, and there are lots of ways that the government can create these incentives. Regulation's one, but remember, they're tax benefits, they're benefits, uh, uh, there's tax policy, they're benefits, they're procurement regulations, there's where they invest money for research and development, there's modeling good behavior. So, for example, when the Navy paid Microsoft last year almost $10 million so that it could keep using Windows XP. That is what I would not call modeling good behavior. Right. So one thing to start would be, OK, fine, let's, let's just clean up our own act. Now, let me be clear. There are lots of tensions about this role for government. One's an economic tension. Nobody likes more regulation, especially in difficult economic times. The great fear when uh, President Obama did his early cybersecurity review was that it was going to call for regulation. And in fact, early drafts did, but we were in a tremendous recession globally. And the president and his executives struck that out. Leading industry executives, I'll quote one in particular, to say, we dodged a bullet there. Well, I think the bullet's going to find us. Moreover, there's another problem here, which also deals with law, and I'll get to this in just a moment, and that is we don't want to be you know, too quick to rule out various forms of cyber attacks because, of course, our own governments engage in them. And so we can't take an overly strong stance against something that we, in fact, do. Even, even our limited sense of hypocrisy would be troubled by that. So, for example, the current head of the NSA commented on China's alleged role in the Anthem medical data breach, saying, look, if they were after medical files on important government officials, I'd admire them. I'd do the same thing. This is by the man who's in charge of our cyber defenses. And then there are always tensions about privacy and government overreach when the government gets involved in this type of activity. And this is one of the things that's held up the discussion for so long about information sharing. When you share information about threats, you almost always are going to share personal data. Right? If I send you the file from the attack on my system, it's going to include some personal information about the things that were attacked. All we want is the government to say we won't use that personal information for any other purpose. And governments cannot bring themselves to do that. They just can't. They, they, it's an it's a, it's a incredible difficulty to say, you know, if we find something auditable or we find something else criminal, we're not going to use the data for that as well. And so not surprisingly, if you know when you give the government data, it can use it against you, you're a little hesitant to do that. OK, so in addition to setting, creating incentives for better behavior by everyone, uh, second, the law can set limits. It can set limits on the cyber attacks that the governments themselves engage in. It can set limit on um, the reuse of the information that it has. It can set limits on its own behavior in terms of uh, 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 encouraging or in some cases requiring uh, backdoors into encryption products. Right? The, the law can restrain the government in important ways that not only protect human rights but also advance cybersecurity. And around the world, we have been loath to do that. Third, law is a critical part of engaging our international partners. Uh, cybersecurity is not a domestic issue, not anywhere. It is always international. The vast majority of attacks cross national borders. We all are living our lives on networks that are connected internationally. And it is very difficult to conduct diplomacy on a non-governmental level. So if we really want to talk with the Chinese, or we really want to talk with the Russians, or we really want to talk with anybody about our common interests in this area, it's going to be up to our governments to help do that. Now, I don't mean they have to do it alone, but if they don't lead there, it's going to be very hard for anyone else. 
Let me just give you a really practical example. One major issue in the U.S.-Chinese relationship over cybersecurity is whether industrial espionage is part of national security or not. Now, in the United States, we argue vociferously that there is a bright line between the two, that it's perfectly all right to break into your network and spy for purposes of national security, but it's not all right to do it for purposes of economic advantage. There are two problems with that. One is the Chinese don't agree. And the second is uh, there's no international law that really helps support that either. Right? But by the way, the US might be right. I'm not for a moment taking a position on this issue. I'm just saying if we want to advance that position internationally, we'd be better to engage other countries, like-minded countries, countries that we share a lot in common with, to say maybe we should get that installed as a principle of international law. There's going to be a bright line rule. One will be OK, the other won't be. The fourth thing that law and government can do is, as I've already suggested, get the government's own house in order. Now, a nice place to start would be to get government security to be better. It, it is really hard for governments to crack down on industry behavior when the government's making exactly the same mistakes. And whether it's the UK sending tax data in the mail, uh, uh, backup disks in the mail, or whether it's the U.S. government that seems incapable of securing a, a database, um, it would be a good thing to start to, to, to first get its own house in order. I'm astonished at the limits on doing this. So, for example, the United States has spent a lot of time now, six years uh, publicly, developing Einstein, a, a, a series of systems, Einstein 1, Einstein 2, Einstein 3, which look at uh, email traffic and attempt to discover if there are um, malicious uh, activities going on in it, purely based on code analysis, not on content analysis. So what do you think we do when we discover that? Yeah. Nothing, almost nothing. Now, we have started moving some email into a separate server to be looked at again. But for example, in my university, if a machine is connected to our internet and spewing out viruses, we block it automatically. It doesn't matter whose machine. It could be the president's machine. It, it could be anyone's machine. We just block it. We have a system that blocks it. There is no one in the federal government with that authority. Absolutely nobody. And in fact, in most departments, there's nobody with that authority. Okay, but another thing the government could do to help get its house in order is not just to enhance its own security, but to do things that might make the infrastructure more secure for the rest of us. And again, let me give you a, a, a very US-centric example, and, but a, a, an extremely important one. We have spent well over a decade now trying to protect social security numbers, these nine-digit numbers that are issued to every person used primarily, intended to be used primarily for tax and employment benefits. All it does is link a person to a file. Here's your nine-digit number. It should match with your name and address and so forth. Um, social security numbers were never meant to be private. They've always been public. The, uh, the government prints them on your tax return label. Anyone who reads your mail can see it. Um, the military, up until two years ago, still printed them on identity tags. If so, if you had a, you had a um, 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 duffel bag, that's the right word. There's my military advisor. If you had a duffel bag going on a plane and that identified it as yours, it would have your social security number on it. Right? So we have spent literally billions of dollars trying to secure social security numbers. Why? Why didn't we just publish a directory of them? Right? Because there are still institutions, including banks in the United States, that use social security numbers as default passwords. So, so we are like, it's like trying to protect air. You know, we're just trying to protect this little sphere of air and we're gonna really exert ourselves to do it rather than just acknowledging the air is not gonna be held in. And so let's just make it either illegal for them to try or clearly attach financial penalties to it. And then fifth and finally, um, governments can help, I don't in any way mean to suggest they're the only folks who can, but help think strategically about these issues. You know, one of the challenges in this area is every time we get a new announcement from a government about cybersecurity, without question, it's telling us something we already knew. And in most cases, it's telling us something we knew five years ago. Right. 
Wired magazine entitled its coverage about the president's recent cybersecurity announcement in the United States back to basics, meaning these are like things we were telling people a decade ago, and now the Obama administration has decided to tell us all what we've known we should be doing and aren't doing. We must think strategically about these issues. We must think in a way that will set priorities. We, we, we've spent too much time, people like me and others, telling industry to worry about everything. We've got to figure out what it is to worry about that should first command attention. Too often we've used this idea of critical infrastructure, but in the United States, critical infrastructure is everything. There's nothing not included in the list of critical infrastructure. Absolutely nothing. You are a useless human if you're not on that list somewhere. So that is not a way to help prioritize. If you've got one dollar and we say, make sure you spend it on critical infrastructure, well, there's nothing left. So what could we say that would be more useful guidance to tell industry how to focus that? But most of all, we could think strategically about the future of cyber challenges. Not the challenges we see today, the challenges that are just emerging, are just on the horizon, and we expect to see more of tomorrow as, again, our lives become more digitally mediated. Data not just being stolen, but being altered or substituted, right? Think about it, right now we get all upset if your like, bank account information is accessed by somebody else. Imagine if while they're there, they change it. That'll be something to worry about. Or broader use of ransom demands, right? Largely to date, we, we, we think of ransomware as those things that encrypt your files and pop up saying you have to give money here and then we'll send you an encryption key. But what about ransom demands for not revealing your data? Sure. Not unlike the Sony attack. Right? I've got your data, and for the right amount of money, I won't reveal it. Think about industries like lawyers and accountants and doctors who have sensitive information. Uh, think about cyber attacks that interfere with command and control structures. Right? In the United States, we use uh, wireless networks to control the switches that control trains. We use them to control natural gas pipelines, the flow. Increasingly, local utilities like uh, water and sewage plants use uh, wireless controlled switches. You know, as upset as we might get about people stealing OPM records, imagine when they start mixing clean water with raw sewage. Think, think just what will be involved there, literally. You pollute a city's water supply, it will be five days, five weeks, five months before it can be used again? These are real issues. Like, I'm not making these up. I'm not giving the bad guys any ideas here. Or integrated kinetic and cyber attacks. You know, where we see real troops moving or real attacks or real things happening in the real world and suddenly the internet communication system we have doesn't work. In the United States, one of our largest retailers moved to an all-internet-based communication system. That's how they reached all of their offices through digital, digital phone, digital email, digital fax, until they lost their connection to the internet. They couldn't do a thing. I mean, literally. They were dead. We need to think about this from, an, if you will, an end user's perspective rather than, um, rather than from the government's perspective. We need to think about it from the impact it's going to have on real individuals, us. Not just today, but in the future. Now, let me say, a lot of people give lots of reasons for why law and policy won't work. And the most common is that it's too slow. Right? And that is true. If we're, all we're talking about is legislation, it's way too slow. But let me say, I reject the argument that we can just dismiss the role of law and policy on the basis that technology always moves faster, that attackers always move faster. Right? There is no reason at all that by using law to create appropriate frameworks for behavior, incentives to guide behavior, limits on the things governments will do with data, or do with cyber attacks, that the, that, the, that the role of law and governance cannot be a critical step. Indeed, I would argue, a fundamental step, an essential step in securing our own cyber infrastructure. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Josh. Do you have a sense through research or any other sources of which countries 
few cybersecurity risks and how they do it. So it's like a benchmark that you can measure yourself against as a country. Um, I'm still stymied by your beginning the question, do I have any sense? And the answer is almost always no. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, I don't. And let me say, I don't think there are many examples of where we could say at a national level we see cybersecurity being done well. I think we see countries that get attacked less frequently, that deal with fewer, if you will, threats. Um, uh, there are others here who might have another view. Are there countries that do this? Estonia. Estonia, because it's been through its own catastrophic cyber attack and has learned from the experience. But again, remember, it's a comparatively small country with a, with a much smaller surface area to guard. Yes, please. Thank you. Great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, my question would be, so we've got all this money that we shouldn't be spending on cybersecurity, and I agree with you totally for the reasons that you gave. What should we be doing with that money to address the problems that are created by that insecurity? Yeah, I think we should be spending money on cybersecurity. I think we should just be spending it strategically on cybersecurity. And so instead of chasing, not, uh, um, protecting things, like protecting the perimeter of most organizations, it's virtually impossible. You know, you've got employees coming in every day, they're bringing their own devices, they've got their own uh, USB fobs with them. We want, you know, to save money, we want them to use their own cell phones. And yet we still argue that we're trying to protect the perimeter. We, we've lost the perimeter. We should give up. What we ought to figure out is where it matters. So for example, uh, good backups of data. That's one place I'd spend money. Um, making sure that you can detect alterations in your data, if it matters. Now, if it doesn't matter, um, you know, if it's your family photographs, you may not really worry about that. If, on the other hand, it's financial or trading records, that, that would seem to make a lot of, uh, a lot of difference. Um, it, by the way, I mentioned backups, but let me just say one more word about that. It's not just having the backups, like in a bank vault someplace. It's can you switch to those backups instantly? Uh, you know, one of the things we see is a lot of retailers do a quarter or more of all of their business in the few weeks right around the Christmas holidays. So if your website's down for a week then, you may be bankrupt. So you can have all the backup in the world, but if, it, if it's not instant, if it's not like a generator that switches on when needed, that's not going to help. Um, I think research is another area. Now, you know, I'm a vice president for research. I like research. I, I naturally... Um, but this is interestingly an area where most of our research dollars, I think, have been very poorly spent. We've tended to research things we already know about. You know, how much more research do we need? Well, whatever I say here, I'm going to get in trouble, so I'm going to stop without, uh, with, without uh, uh, making fun of anybody's research. But um, I think we need to really think about researching um, in a risk management way. You know, where is the real risk that we could actually do something about? Uh, Tom Worthington from the Research School of Computer Science. Apart from more research, um, <laughs> As you say, there are, there are no laws mandating this sort of security in most cases, but we do have a corporate governance of ICT standard developed in Australia and adopted internationally, and there are laws about governance of government agencies and companies. Could we simply enforce the law that exists through implementation of the standard which exists, which talks about backups and security and all that stuff? Otherwise, aren't we just reinventing what a lot of us sat around and tables and wrote about 10 years ago? Um, yes, we could, and in fact, I think, it's a, I think it's a brilliant suggestion. In other words, we already have tools in place. Let's, let's try to use them. I'll tell you why I don't think it's adequate, though. Think about something like auto safety. We, we all have some familiarity with autos. We all typically get in them and think that they are secure. And usually it's not because of our knowledge. It's not because like we've checked the tire pressure every day or check the, uh, make sure the engine's working. It's because there are thousands of safety regulations that apply to cars. Now, that's too many. I'm not, I'm not asking for thousands of, of regulations, but it's also backed up by a high degree of liability. If you make a car that is not safe, you're gonna pay for it, even if you manage to thread your way through the regulatory environment. I think we need a, more of a feel about that around cybersecurity particularly where security should matter. So when you're promised security, when it's a transaction that ought to have security, health information, medical, or command and control structures, right now we leave that up to industry. Even when there's a regulator involved, the regulator is rarely competent to deal with the cyber aspect of it. 
So even if I'm a, I'm a food and drug regulator, I regulate pharmaceutical companies, I come in, I look for cleanliness, I look for, do you have locks on the doors, do people wear masks, you know, all of this, but am I really competent to evaluate your software to see if it's compounding correctly? And so again, I think this is areas where, I, I don't want the legislation to say you must do X, Y, or Z, I want the legislation to say you must meet the industry standard or there's gonna be a regulatory body that can adopt the industry standard. So I think we have to think creatively and if you will, iteratively, so that we take advantage of what's there and the ability to, to build on that knowledge, not have to recreate it, but we add some, some oomph to it. We add some real force. Okay, I'm gonna to lean to my right for a little while now. I've been very left wing and I apologize. So we'll start here and come forward. Thanks, Fred. Look, I'd like to add a, a bit of positivity to this, because I agree, um, a lot of it is a glass half full, because it needs to be a glass half full, and it's a call to action. But there are some positive signs. So last year, in, um, I think it was March time frame, ASIC, which is Australian Securities and Investments Commission, they actually produced a report, uh, which is Report 429, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But the important thing is its title does, and that's Cyber, Cyber Resilience Health Check. And the intent is um, ASIC regulates all com public companies and other companies in, in Australia. And so this report is actually quite prescriptive uh, or definitive in terms of what um, companies can do. Sorry, not prescriptive, but definitive. Um, and my belief is that it is actually sufficient such that um, any director that didn't actually take this seriously could be uh, considered as being negligent. So at some point in time in the future, there will be a class action against a set of directors who have not actually considered this report and not actually asked these questions. Even if they've asked the questions and not sought the right answers or not actually seriously followed through, they'll still be negligent. And so I think we'll start to see the courts actually act in our favour too. I think we're just at that point where these things are now in place and they can start to work in our favor. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. And as you might expect, I didn't know about that specific report. Uh, let me just, lest we get up too optimistic, let me just add one more negative um, uh, view here. So um, you remember it's been um, close to 40 hours since I've last slept in a bed. So if I'm feeling negative, you'll understand why. And that is, in the US, we've had maybe 300 class action lawsuits uh, around data breaches, for example. And all but three, I think, have failed because of the difficulty of showing harm and the difficulty of showing the harm was due to the breach. Um, now, they probably should have failed. I'm not for a moment um, um, criticizing those judges. Those were probably all very wise decisions. But it's a long, slow process. Maybe it's faster in Australia, but but it needs to be faster. We're dealing with a challenge so vast and expanding so rapidly that if we wait for a slow judicial process to work, I, I, I worry that it, it may be too little too late. Yeah, I'm, I'm not suggesting this is in the context of data breach. I'm actually suggesting this is in the context of a severe loss of yes. business functionality yeah. and therefore profitability, more likely to be shareholders that will actually sue because of a lot of a loss of profitability and therefore... Uh, They'll be able to show harm. Yeah. And I think from that point of view, it'll be easier to do than the data breach scenario. Okay. So I agree with you entirely. Great. Just hand the microphone on down there if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, uh, just on, on that point, uh, one of the trends we're seeing in Australia already with the, the companies that take cybersecurity seriously, admittedly, uh, which is not everyone, um, a lot of contractual arrangements before they enter into um, business with a supplier, they'll say, show us your ICT security so set, set up. We want to be certain that when we send you data about our, our customers, that you've got it secure. So rather than getting through the, um, the actual civil lawsuit stuff, it's actually um, preemptive, which is really encouraging. But uh, the, uh, the point I wanted to make was, uh, before the comment as much, um, I work in cybersecurity and government and policy, and uh, I, I do have a rather bleak existence, uh, look at my own country and go, oh, we could do a lot better. But I want to thank you tonight because I actually been sitting down listening to all the, um, the, the things that the law can do and I actually think, well, actually, we're not doing too badly. Okay. Um, and I'll give you one case in point. My colleagues around probably grin because they are spruiking my department. Um, we've got setups already, institutional setups that help businesses uh, 
protect themselves without regulating them to tell them and how they to do it. Uh, we have organisations like uh, Computer Emergency Response Australia, CERT Australia, there's an equivalent US CERT, um, and there's around the world the whole thing. They've got setups where they can actually advise on, and su give support to critical infrastructure, closely defined as well. Um, and they have non disclosure agreements. So we can, being a civilian agency, if they show us their books and we go, oh, that doesn't look right, we're actually not allowed to pass it on to the law enforcement. What it does, it builds relationship with that. We're also not an intelligence agency, therefore, we're not allowed to, we're, we're given that trust. Those relationships, I find, have been vital across government to actually promote cybersecurity without being the heavy hand of government. And also, just one other point is, like within Australia, we have um, very clear distinctions, legally distinctions, between what the different cybersecurity operational agencies can actually do and what they can't do. And so we have a, a body called the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, which bring all these bodies together, but they have very cl clear legislative limits on what they can and can't do. So CERT sits in there being uh, the civilian arm looking at business, the AFP, Australian Federal Police, sorry, they have theirs uh, for law enforcement. We have the spooks doing their spooky stuff, I'm not sure. But whilst they, whilst they have a limited sharing capacity, they're actually not um, you know, overly collaborating to, they're, they're co-located to certainly be used to say you know, we're not you know, blending too much. And I, I know it seems that the picture you painted tonight, very, very bleak, and I, I was sort of thinking, okay, I can see it all. But at the same time, I am feeling a lot better about myself, which so I wanted to thank you for. Good. Well, I'm delighted. I mean, really, I have nothing else. I feel like we've accomplished something worthwhile. But you didn't mention throwing his cat. <laughs> and I also, yeah, you know, this is an area which is hard to be overly optimistic about. So let me say it's not, it's not like the weather. You can have great weather. You can have bad weather. We pretty much all know what it is. Um, th this is an area where when you look at the a degree of change and the speed of change, um, it, you know, it's hard to know what a, what a perfect solution would look like. And I don't want to in any way um, obfuscate that. I mean, I, I recognize that, and I recognize that there are many people doing their best to make the situation better. Uh, I would still argue that on the whole, we have not been well served um, as a society broadly by the types of responses we see from the governance system, from the legal system. And that, to some extent, we've done as well as we have, largely because of the goodwill, the number of companies, the number of individual agencies who have stepped forward to do something that they thought was right in the circumstances. But I do worry. I still think about cybersecurity more in terms of like natural disaster or war. And imagine you know, catastrophic flooding, thousands, maybe millions of people displaced from their, from their homes and their businesses. Are any of us prepared to deal with that? I mean, do, do we have a government response plan that doesn't involve using the internet? Um, right, and you would be unique in the world in terms of, of, of having that. Because I can tell you, I mean, for example, when the United States the Department of Homeland Security runs its cybersecurity tabletop exercises, it runs them from nine to five. Because it doesn't want to pay overtime for the employees. So we just hope the attackers also stop at five. Well, you know, I don't really want to pay overtime either. I'm not, I mean, that's a rational decision, but it leads me to question whether the results of the tabletop exercise, you know, the, the merit they, they, they carry. Fred, thank you for that. That was, that was wonderful, enlightening, and depressing in equal measure. Um, can, can you make a further comment about, about this tendency of, of access creep into, into data when in, in the private sphere, we have companies like Apple which will say, we just don't give our data out to anyone, any other third party. We just don't do it. And, and there's a measure of trust given to that and so forth and we do it. But we know when, when we give government, government data, they, they, as you said, are very reluctant to ever say we won't pass it to anyone else. They'll uh, put some weasel words around it and say, uh, accept according to law or something like that. Um, and is it anything more than just sort of bureaucratic creep that uh, any decent bureaucrat will try and do their job in the easiest way. And if you're a copper and you know that the, the traffic department has got traffic cameras and you've got a murder on your hands, 
you'll ask the traffic department, can I have a look at your CCTV, please? There might be something on it. Even though when the traffic cameras were installed, everyone crossed their hearts and said, this will only be used for managing traffic. And you see that creep going forward all the time, that, that um, there's a reach into the data, into the data systems of other agencies. Uh, not, and I'm not suggesting it's always for nefarious characteristics, but it's but there's no there's no policy set for any of this. There's no it's just a it's just a, 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 a creeping connection of things because you can. Um, it, it's a great question. Let me um, let me say this. I, I am not the least bit concerned about, for example, the the example you gave no, no, of no, uh, gave. you know using the uh, CCTV to track down a murderer. And my guess is most people would not be widely concerned. And in fact, that's probably the way it should work. In other words, you would articulate a serious purpose. You might go to a court or someplace and get authorization. Then you'd get to use the data. The the type of creep I'm talking about is where we. Um, you know, it may just be to the natural acquisitiveness of government agencies. Uh, when we get data, it's, for example, it's very hard to get our government agency or a company, uh, we could put them all together here, to delete something. They, they just think they might need it a little bit later. And you undoubtedly know this has been a constant fight for the past 15 years between Europe and the United States over, for example, passenger records when someone travels. You know, nobody's saying don't check the passenger against the um, uh, terrorist watch list. They're just saying delete the name after you do. And we're like, well, we just like to keep that maybe 20 years or 25 years. And what are we going to do with it? No bloody idea what we're going to do with it. But if we've got it, if we've spent taxpayer dollars to collect it, let's hang on to it. And I think that has become a real issue in the data world. Um, we saw this again, I'm, I'm going to stick with US I I examples here. In our Transportation Security Administration, wanted to uh, be able to run background checks, uh, very limited background checks, on all passengers. And they wanted a bunch of data to do it, 19 data elements, including your credit card information you used to pay for the ticket. Um, everybody opposed this. Congress opposed it, the airlines opposed it, the public opposed it, in large part because it was an overreach for the purpose, and in large part because the uh, TSA, the uh, Security Administration, wouldn't agree to not use it for other purposes. Once they agreed, actually Congress passed a law saying they could only use it for other purposes, they discovered all they really needed was your full name, your gender, and your date of birth, just three data elements. Well, so you have less data, serving a limited purpose, protected by law, and it goes off without a hitch. It, it works incredibly well. I think that's where we need to get with cybersecurity, is, is a certain sense of, of rationality. Um, I worry about it not just from a privacy or data protection point of view. I, I worry about it from an efficacy point of view. If we overload people with too much data, they're going to miss the important bits. If we can focus instead on what be, might be most relevant for the purpose at hand, you know, we have a chance they might get the job done. So I, I guess I'm going to dial it back to bleak for everybody. OK, good. good. I can be the optimist now. This will be a, a real change. So we hear a lot about um, the US in particular insisting on, well, put it, putting pressure on companies for backdoors into their data. And there's a lot of heated rhetoric uh, around the dissemination of such basic technologies encryption. Um, might the lack of interest in furthering the interests of a secure cyberspace be a calculated position on the part of governments you know, in a, as a part of an effort to maintain an advantage, uh, as it were, over the private sector? Yes, I, I think almost certainly th th that case. And you know, one of the pretty consistent recommendations of the many different groups, including uh, the president's own um, National Security Review Group, is to separate out, for example, in the National Security Agency, the um, offensive um, uh, use of cyber weapons from the defensive use, that those should be in separate agencies, so that you don't have this incentive problem about do we want to fix problems or not fix them because we're exploiting them. And uh, for whatever reason, the president has absolutely refused to do that. In fact, he's collapsed them together even more clearly. So I think we have to assume that the defense message is in part being compromised by the offense message. You know, if, I, if this vulnerability persists, I can use it to my advantage. And I suspect that's true in governance. It may be true in some industries as well. You know, are you sure you want to report a known vulnerability if you can use it in a way that advances your, your interest? Given that they have expressed this interest 
in maintaining a, a weak state of, of the infrastructure, how could we encourage them to consider the costs, or could we even realistically expect the costs to outweigh the, the benefits to them? Um, it, it's a, an excellent and really tricky, uh, really tricky question. The most successful argument so far has been, I think, the international competitiveness one, which is if we do it, then everyone's going to flock to Australian encryption or German encryption or something else if ours is known to be weak. I mean, you know, would you, would, would you go on the lot and buy a car that you are told has a defect, but you're not told what the defect is? Or would you want to buy a car that works, you know, that has no known defect? Now, what worries me is that we end up seeing an agreement among a handful of key nations that they all want backdoors. You know, China would like backdoors. I'm just guessing Russia would like backdoors. The US wants backdoors. Uh, you know, would the five eyes all say we want backdoors? And if so, is that international competitiveness argument gonna, gonna work any longer? But, but, but I think for the moment it, it is. And even in the United States, and again, there are people here in a, probably a better position to comment than I am, I think it's largely now down to the FBI, the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, that is still arguing for the back doors. I, I think most of the intelligence agencies have said, uh, you know, we, we understand that's a lost argument. Um, not wanting to pile on to the problems, but um, <laughs> something I think um, we do need to address, and it picks up on points that Gary and Simon and, and this gentleman made, is actually working out um, where we've got things that work well and cybersecurity just needs to be normalised as part of that and raising awareness and skills so people understand how to apply it. And then where we've got genuine gaps and it needs interventions and, and new approaches and actually prioritising those as a discrete issue. Because I think when you're looking at incentives and interventions, no one likes broad ranging ones that are designed to fix 10 things and actually don't fix anything well which is a risk in cybersecurity when it can mean so many different things to different people. And so with that in mind, with incentives and standard setting and, and looking at creative ways to do that, what do you see insurance companies' roles as in this space? I'm sorry we're out of time, but... <laughs> I had to go a step too far. Um, I actually don't like insurance in this area, but I'll tell you exactly why, and I, you may appreciate it, such an uninformed opinion, you're, you regret asking as much as I regret that you asked it. Um, I think there's a tremendous kind of moral hazard problem here, which is if you say to people you've got insurance for this, it, um, it's not doing anything to improve the infrastructure, it's just shifting some of the economic costs from one party to another, but you have exactly the same problem. And I would rather try to address the problem. Um, on the other hand, if I ran a business and faced this you know, massive liability, if I had a tremendous breach that actually did cause clear harm, or, or if there were, for example, federal statutory penalties that said if you have a breach, you, you, you pay a certain amount of money, then I would want to pass off that loss to somebody else. And insurance would be one way of doing that. The best thing I can say about insurance, and it's, it's quite good, is that Insurance today, at least in the US, is effectively setting the standard for cybersecurity in many industries. Because you know, insurers don't just come in and say, we'll just take your loss. They say, we've got a list of 45 things you have to do, and when you've done these, then we'll take your loss under certain circumstances. And so it may in fact be that insurance becomes the de facto regulator or incentive creator for cybersecurity in, in some economies. On the whole, I would still rather see that be led either by government or by industry expert groups. Um, but that, you know, well, I may have to be satisfied with, with what I can get, so. Professor Kate, thank you very much. Thank for you very much. What, what was both a stimulating, thought-provoking, and particularly provocative presentation <laughs> over the last hour. I myself am convinced about strict liability now after listening to you. Um, but I just would like to invite everybody to join hands and thank Professor Kate for that. <laughs>